On an otherwise ordinary morning, I woke up to the usual routine. The sun was shining, and the aroma of fresh coffee filled the kitchen. I glanced at the clock and realized it was already 8 a.m. After pouring myself a cup of coffee, I sat down at the kitchen table to browse the news on my tablet. The peacefulness of the morning was interrupted by the sound of the doorbell ringing. Surprised, I put down my tablet and walked towards the door. Through the peephole, I saw a delivery person standing there with a package in hand. I opened the door and accepted the package, noticing that it was unmarked except for a handwritten note taped to the top. The note read, These belong to your lovely wife. Give this to her. She forgot them last night at my place. A sense of unease washed over me as I brought the package inside. I placed it on the kitchen counter and stared at it, trying to make sense of the situation. My wife, Yolanda, had mentioned a girl's night out with her friends the previous evening, but she hadn't come home yet. I glanced at my phone to check if there were any messages from her, but there were none. Deciding to ignore the package for the moment, I continued with my morning routine. I took a shower, got dressed, and made myself breakfast. As I sat down to eat, my mind kept drifting back to the mysterious package. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The clock struck 9.30 a.m., and I realized I needed to leave for work. I worked as a graphic designer at a small advertising firm downtown. Grabbing my laptop bag, I took one last look at the package before heading out the door. The note's words echoed in my mind as I drove to the office. At work, I tried to focus on my projects, but my concentration was shattered. I kept glancing at my phone, hoping for a message from Yolanda. My colleagues noticed my distraction and asked if everything was all right. I brushed off their concerns with a forced smile, not wanting to explain the situation until I had more information. Lunchtime arrived, and I decided to step out for some fresh air. I walked to a nearby cafe and ordered a sandwich, choosing a table by the window. As I ate, I couldn't help but replay the events of the morning in my head. Who could have sent that package and why? My mind was a whirl of questions without answers. Returning to the office, I tried to immerse myself in my work. The hours ticked by slowly, and the afternoon dragged on. By 4 p.m., I couldn't take it anymore. I decided to leave work early and head home to confront the mystery head-on. I packed up my things and informed my boss that I wasn't feeling well. Driving home, I felt a knot of anxiety in my stomach. As soon as I walked through the front door, I made a beeline for the kitchen counter where the package still sat. The note stared back at me, mocking my confusion. I paced around the kitchen, debating whether to open it or wait for Yolanda to come home. Minutes felt like hours, and the silence of the house was oppressive. I decided to distract myself by doing some chores. I washed the dishes, took out the trash, and even vacuumed the living room. Despite my efforts, the package remained a constant presence in the back of my mind. It was now 6 p.m., and there was still no sign of Yolanda. I decided to make dinner, hoping that cooking would take my mind off things. I prepared a simple pasta dish and sat down to eat, but the food tasted like cardboard. My appetite was non-existent. After dinner, I turned on the TV, flipping through channels aimlessly. The noise filled the room, but it did nothing to quell my growing sense of dread. Finally, I couldn't take it any longer. I walked over to the kitchen counter and picked up the package. My hands trembled slightly as I contemplated what to do next. I decided to wait just a little longer. Perhaps Yolanda would walk through the door any minute now, and I could confront her about the package. The clock ticked on, and my patience wore thin. I paced the living room, checking my phone every few minutes. Still nothing. By 8 p.m., my frustration had reached its peak. I knew I couldn't wait any longer. I took a deep breath, picked up the package once more, and steeled myself for whatever I might find inside. With trembling hands, I opened the package. Inside, I found a pile of smelly, dirty lingerie. The odor was overwhelming, and I recoiled in disgust. My mind raced with horrified thoughts. This was what she was doing on her so-called girl's night out? My anxiety escalated when I realized she hadn't come home yet. The contents were a stark contrast to the serene morning routine I had just completed. I glanced around the kitchen, 
the sun still shining through the windows, casting long shadows on the floor. The lingering smell of coffee was now tainted by the stench of the lingerie. I turned on the kitchen fan to help disperse the odor, but it clung to the air, stubbornly refusing to dissipate. Leaving the package on the counter, I walked to the living room and turned on the TV, hoping for some distraction. The evening news was on, but I couldn't focus on the headlines. The words from the note kept echoing in my mind. My wife, Yolanda, had always been trustworthy, or so I thought. The thought of her being unfaithful was like a punch to the gut. Determined to find some answers, I decided to search the house for any clues. I started in the bedroom, checking her closet and drawers for anything unusual. Her clothes were neatly hung, her jewelry box untouched. Nothing seemed out of place, yet the package on the kitchen counter told a different story. I moved on to her home office, a small room she used for her freelance writing work. Her desk was cluttered with papers, notebooks, and a laptop. I sifted through the papers, finding only drafts of her latest articles and notes for upcoming projects. Frustrated, I sat down at her desk and opened her laptop. After entering her password, I scanned through her emails and messages, but found nothing suspicious. Returning to the kitchen, I stared at the package once more. The smell had become more bearable, but the sight of the lingerie still made my stomach churn. I decided to take a break and stepped outside for some fresh air. The evening breeze was cool, and the sounds of the neighborhood were a welcome distraction from the turmoil inside. As I walked around the block, I noticed familiar faces from our street. Mrs. Henderson was watering her garden, and Mr. Lee was walking his dog. I waved to them, forcing a smile, but my mind was elsewhere. How could Yolanda do this to me? The question kept nagging at me, refusing to let go. Returning home, I saw that it was now 7 p.m. There was still no word from Yolanda. I checked my phone again, hoping for a missed call or a message, but there was nothing. The unease in my stomach grew stronger, and I knew I couldn't wait much longer. I went back to the kitchen and examined the package once more. Among the lingerie was a small, ornate box. It was old and worn, with intricate carvings on the lid. I hesitated before reaching for it, unsure if I was ready to see what was inside. Before opening the box, I decided to call Yolanda's closest friends, hoping they might know something. I dialed Emily first, who answered after a few rings. I asked if she had seen Yolanda, or if she knew where she might be. Emily sounded surprised and concerned, saying she hadn't heard from Yolanda since the previous night. She promised to try calling her, and let me know if she found anything out. Next, I called Rachel, another of Yolanda's friends. Rachel was just as clueless and worried. She mentioned they had a great time last night, but parted ways around midnight. None of her friends seemed to know anything about the package or Yolanda's whereabouts. With no new information from her friends, I returned to the kitchen. It was now nearly 8 p.m., and the house felt emptier than ever. I sat down at the kitchen table, the box in front of me. Taking a deep breath, I opened it. Inside, I found several personal items. The smell was unbearable, and I had to hold my breath to keep from gagging. There were old letters, stained and crumpled, photographs that had seen better days, and a few pieces of jewelry that looked like they hadn't been worn in years. The items were a disgusting testament to Yolanda's infidelity, confirming my worst fears. The reality of the situation hit me hard. This wasn't just a prank or a misunderstanding. Yolanda had been unfaithful, and now I had the evidence right in front of me. I closed the box and pushed it away, feeling a wave of nausea wash over me. It was now clear that I needed to confront Yolanda, but she was still nowhere to be found. I decided to wait a little longer, hoping she would come home soon. The minutes ticked by, and my patience wore thin. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. As the clock struck 9 p.m., I knew I couldn't wait any longer. I needed answers, and I needed them now. I took a deep breath and prepared myself for what was to come. Panic-stricken, I dialed her number, but her phone was off. The sense of urgency pushed me to try again, but each attempt led to the same result. I left several messages, hoping she would see them and call back. Realizing I couldn't just wait around, I decided to investigate further. 
I returned to the kitchen and focused on the small, ornate box that accompanied the lingerie. It was covered in intricate carvings, clearly old and worn. With a deep breath, I carefully opened the box. The sight and stench were unbearable, causing me to gag and step back. I managed to hold it together and peek inside. The box contained several personal items, old letters, stained and crumpled photographs, and a few pieces of tarnished jewelry. Each item told a sordid story of Yolanda's infidelity. The combination of the visual and olfactory assault was overwhelming, making me vomit into the kitchen sink, wiping my mouth. I knew I needed to piece together more of the puzzle. I went back to Yolanda's home office, sifting through more papers and notebooks. I checked her calendar, which was meticulously filled out with appointments and reminders. I noticed a meeting she had scheduled for that afternoon, but she never showed up. I decided to call the place where she had her appointment. After a few rings, a receptionist answered. I inquired if Yolanda had made it to her meeting. The receptionist confirmed she never showed up, heightening my concern. I thanked her and hung up, more puzzled than ever. Next, I decided to call her workplace. Yolanda worked as a freelance writer for a magazine, so I called her editor. He mentioned that she had submitted her latest article but hadn't been in touch since. He assumed she was working on her next piece and expressed surprise at my concern. With no new leads, I returned to the living room and turned on the television. The local news was running, but I found myself distracted. The anchors spoke of mundane events, none of which could tear my focus from the crisis at hand. I absent-mindedly flipped through the channels, stopping at a crime drama. The unfolding scenes mirrored my turmoil, and I couldn't watch any longer. I grabbed my keys and decided to drive to some of Yolanda's favorite places. I checked the nearby coffee shop where she liked to write, but the barista said they hadn't seen her all day. Next, I visited the park where she often took walks. I wandered the trails, calling her name, but she was nowhere to be found. Feeling the weight of time slipping away, I returned home. It was now nearing 10 p.m., and I was growing increasingly desperate. I decided to call Yolanda's parents, who lived out of town. They were just as alarmed and promised to try reaching her. They also suggested I contact her closest friends again, just in case they had heard anything new. I dialed Emily's number once more. She answered, sounding groggy, but confirmed she hadn't heard from Yolanda since our earlier conversation. I then called Rachel, who echoed the same concern. Both friends promised to keep their phones on and let me know if they heard anything. I slumped onto the couch, staring at the clock. Time was ticking by, and my options were dwindling. In a last-ditch effort, I decided to drive to the last place she was seen, Emily's house. Maybe there was something I had missed. I grabbed a flashlight and drove over. Emily's house was in a quiet neighborhood. The streets were empty, and the houses were dark. I knocked on her door, and she answered in her pajamas, surprised to see me. I explained my desperation, and she invited me in to retrace Yolanda's steps. Emily recounted their night out, mentioning the bar they visited and the taxi ride home. She confirmed that Yolanda had left her place around midnight. I thanked Emily and decided to drive to the bar, hoping to find some clue. The bar was nearly empty at this hour. The bartender, a young man with tattoos, remembered Yolanda and her friends. He mentioned they left together but didn't notice anything unusual. Frustrated but determined, I left the bar and returned home. It was now past midnight. I parked the car and sat there for a moment trying to collect my thoughts. My mind raced with possibilities. As I stepped out of the car, I noticed something peculiar. Yolanda's car was parked a few blocks down the street. It hadn't been there earlier. I rushed to her car, peering inside. It was empty, but her purse was in the passenger seat. I tried the doors, but they were locked. This discovery both relieved and terrified me. Yolanda had been here, but where was she now? I hurried back to the house, ready to call the police. The situation had escalated beyond anything I could handle on my own. It was time to get professional help involved. Frantic and disoriented, I called the police to report the disturbing package. The dispatcher asked for details, and I fumbled through my explanation, trying to convey the seriousness of the situation. 
As I described the contents of the package, a knock at the door interrupted me. I hesitated for a moment before opening the door. Two detectives stood there, their expressions grim. One was tall and thin with a sharp gaze, while the other was shorter, stockier, and wore glasses. They introduced themselves as Detectives Miller and Cooper. Detective Miller spoke first. We received a call about a suspicious package. May we come in? I nodded and stepped aside, letting them into the living room. They quickly took in the scene. The open package on the kitchen counter, the small box beside it. Can you walk us through what happened? Detective Cooper asked, pulling out a notebook. I recounted the events of the day, starting with the arrival of the package and the disturbing note. As I spoke, the detectives examined the items on the counter. Detective Miller used a pen to lift the lingerie, revealing the dirty, stained garments. When did you last see your wife? Miller asked, jotting down notes. Last night, she said she was going out with friends but didn't come home. Did she mention where she was going? Cooper inquired. She said she was having a girl's night out with her friends. I've already called them, and they don't know where she is either. The detectives exchanged a glance. We need to take these items into evidence, Miller said. We'll also need to look around the house for anything that might help us understand what's going on. I agreed and led them through the house, starting with Yolanda's home office. They carefully inspected her desk, flipping through papers and checking her laptop. Miller asked about any recent changes in her behavior or if she had mentioned anyone new in her life. I explained that nothing seemed out of the ordinary until today. Next, we moved to the bedroom. The detectives examined her closet and drawers, finding nothing unusual. They took note of the clothes she had worn last night, which were still laid out on a chair. Cooper asked if Yolanda had any known enemies or if there had been any recent arguments. I told them about the phone calls to her friends and workplace, reiterating that no one had seen her. We returned to the living room, where the detectives made a few more notes. We're going to need to take a closer look at her car, Miller said. You mentioned it was parked a few blocks down the street? I nodded and led them outside. The detectives followed me to Yolanda's car, which was still parked in the same spot. They circled the vehicle, peering inside with flashlights. Miller radioed for a forensic team to come and examine the car more thoroughly. Cooper asked if I had a spare key, which I did. Using the key, they unlocked the car and began a detailed search. They found her purse on the passenger seat, as I had mentioned. Inside were her wallet, phone charger, and a few personal items, but nothing out of the ordinary. The back seat was empty, and the trunk contained only a few reusable grocery bags. We'll need to take the car in for a more thorough examination, Cooper said. In the meantime, do you have any other places she might have gone? Anywhere she likes to visit regularly? I thought for a moment. There's a cafe she goes to often, and she likes to take walks in the park. I checked those places earlier, but maybe I missed something. The detectives noted the locations and assured me they would check them out. Miller's radio crackled, and he stepped aside to listen. When he returned, his expression was more serious. We have some officers on their way to search the areas you mentioned, he said. In the meantime, we need you to stay here in case she tries to contact you. They left with the evidence, promising to keep me updated. I returned to the house, feeling the weight of the situation bearing down on me. As the night wore on, I kept my phone close, hoping for a call or a message from Yolanda. I tried to keep myself busy by cleaning up the kitchen and straightening up the living room. Each minute felt like an hour, and the silence in the house was deafening. Around midnight, the doorbell rang again. I rushed to the door, my heart pounding. The detectives had returned, their expressions unchanged. We need to talk, Miller said, stepping inside. There's been a development. I led them to the living room where they asked me to sit down. Cooper remained standing, his gaze steady. We found your wife, Miller began, but not as you might have expected. One of her affair partners. The words hung in the air as I braced myself for the rest of the story. The detectives delivered a shocking message. My wife had been found, but not as I had expected. One of her affair partners had exacted brutal revenge. The gruesome details were hard to process. Detective Miller cleared his throat breaking the heavy silence. 
We found her in a motel room on the outskirts of town. It appears she was with someone named Gary Richardson, one of her affair partners. He paused as if to gauge my reaction. Gary Richardson? I repeated, trying to recall the name. I didn't recognize it, but then again, there were many things about Yolanda's life I had evidently been unaware of. Cooper continued, It seems there was an altercation. The scene was violent. Gary Richardson was found dead, and your wife was severely injured. Where is she now? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She's at the hospital under police protection, Miller said. We're still trying to piece together exactly what happened. They handed me a card with the hospital's information. I glanced at it, my mind reeling. The detectives took their leave, promising to keep me updated on any new developments. I was left standing in the living room, staring at the card, trying to make sense of everything. Needing to clear my head, I decided to visit the hospital immediately. I grabbed my keys and drove through the quiet, late-night streets. The city's usual hustle and bustle had given way to a serene, almost eerie calm. Streetlights cast long shadows on the pavement, and occasional headlights passed me by, illuminating the dark road ahead. When I arrived at the hospital, the fluorescent lights and antiseptic smell hit me like a wave. The emergency room was relatively empty, with only a few patients waiting to be seen. I approached the reception desk, where a tired-looking nurse glanced up at me. I'm here to see Yolanda, I said, handing over the card the detectives had given me. The nurse checked her computer and nodded. She's in room 314, but you should know she's under police protection. I'll need to get clearance for you. I waited as she made a quick call. After a few moments, a uniformed officer approached me. You must be her husband, he said. Follow me. We walked down a sterile, white corridor, passing closed doors and the occasional staff member. The officer stopped in front of room 314 and knocked softly before opening the door. Inside, I saw Yolanda lying in a hospital bed, hooked up to various machines. Her face was bruised, and she had bandages on her arms and head. I stepped into the room, feeling a strange mixture of relief and dread. The officer stayed by the door, giving us some privacy while still keeping watch. Yolanda stirred and opened her eyes, her gaze meeting mine. Walter, she whispered, her voice weak. Yolanda, I replied, unsure of what to say. The gravity of the situation hung heavily between us. She tried to sit up but winced in pain. I didn't want you to find out like this. What happened? I asked, my voice more steady than I felt. We were at the motel, she began. Gary and I, we had been seeing each other for a while, but things got out of hand. He found out I was seeing someone else too, and he snapped. Her words came out haltingly, as if each sentence cost her a great deal of effort. He attacked me. I tried to fight back, but he was too strong. I thought I was going to die. I listened, absorbing the information, trying to understand the chain of events that led us here. Why didn't you tell me? I asked, though I already knew the answer. I was afraid, she said, tears welling up in her eyes. I didn't want to hurt you, and I didn't know how to stop. A nurse entered the room, checking Yolanda's vitals and adjusting her for. She needs rest, the nurse said, giving me a sympathetic look. You can come back tomorrow. I nodded and turned to leave, but Yolanda grabbed my hand weakly. I'm sorry, Walter, she whispered. I left the hospital, the weight of her words heavy on my shoulders. The drive home was a blur my mind replaying the events of the night over and over. By the time I got back, it was nearly dawn. The house felt cold and empty, a stark contrast to the turmoil inside me. I sat on the couch, staring at the evidence the detectives had left behind. The dirty lingerie, the soiled letters, the ornate box, all tangible reminders of Yolanda's betrayal. But now, they were also symbols of her suffering and the violent reality she had been living in. As the first light of morning crept through the windows, I knew that the path ahead would be difficult. There were many questions to be answered, and many wounds that would take time to heal. But for now, all I could do was take it one step at a time. As I grappled with the information, a whirlwind of emotions engulfed me. Betrayal, shock, and a strange sense of justice clashed within me. 
She had been unfaithful, and now she had paid a terrible price for her deception. Though I knew it was wrong, a part of me felt a twisted satisfaction. Karma had delivered its verdict. The next morning, I woke up to the sound of my phone buzzing incessantly. Friends and family were calling, having heard bits and pieces of the story from the news or social media. I ignored most of the calls, not ready to explain what had happened. I made coffee and sat at the kitchen table trying to piece together my thoughts. The detectives had promised to keep me informed, but there was still so much I didn't understand. I decided to distract myself with some mundane tasks. The lawn needed mowing, and the garden had been neglected for weeks. I put on some old clothes and headed outside, hoping the physical activity would help clear my mind. As I pushed the mower across the lawn, I thought about the first time Yolanda and I had worked on the garden together. It had been one of our favorite weekend activities. Now, those memories felt distant and tainted. After finishing the lawn, I turned to the flower beds, pulling weeds and trimming bushes. The sun was high in the sky by the time I was done, and I was drenched in sweat. I went back inside, showered, and changed into fresh clothes. The house felt eerily quiet. I decided to visit the café Yolanda frequented, hoping to find some semblance of normalcy. The drive there was uneventful, but the café was bustling with activity. I ordered a coffee and found a seat by the window, watching people go about their day. The barista, a young woman with bright blue hair, brought me my coffee. Hey, aren't you Walter? She asked, looking at me curiously. I nodded, not sure where the conversation was going. I've seen you here with Yolanda a few times, she continued. Is everything okay? I heard some rumors. I sighed, realizing that word had spread faster than I anticipated. It's complicated, I replied. Yolanda's in the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope she gets better soon, she said, her expression genuinely sympathetic. After finishing my coffee, I decided to take a walk in the park. It was a place where Yolanda and I had spent many afternoons together. The park was serene, with children playing and couples strolling hand in hand. I walked along the path, taking in the sights and sounds, trying to find some solace. I stopped by a bench near the pond, watching the ducks swim lazily across the water. An elderly couple sat on the next bench, feeding the ducks with pieces of bread. Their simple, quiet companionship made me feel a pang of longing for the life I thought I had with Yolanda. Later in the afternoon, I headed back to the hospital. The nurses recognized me and allowed me to visit Yolanda. She was awake, looking a bit better than the night before. I sat by her bedside, unsure of what to say. Walter, she said softly, breaking the silence. Thank you for coming back. I needed to know what happened, I replied, my voice steady. Yolanda explained more about her relationship with Gary Richardson. It had started as a fling, a way for her to escape the monotony of our marriage. But Gary had become possessive and violent. She had tried to end things with him multiple times, but he always managed to draw her back in. The night at the motel had been her final attempt to break free. I never wanted any of this to happen, she said, tears rolling down her cheeks. I made terrible mistakes and I hurt you. I don't expect you to forgive me. I listened, absorbing her words. The betrayal still stung, but I could see the genuine remorse in her eyes. We talked for a while longer until the nurse came in to check her vitals. I'll come back tomorrow, I told her before leaving. Back home, I went through our bedroom, packing some of Yolanda's clothes and personal items to take to the hospital. I found a photo album tucked away in the back of her closet. It was filled with pictures from our early years together, smiling faces, vacations, and family gatherings. Flipping through the pages, I was reminded of the love we had once shared. The next day, I returned to the hospital with the packed bag. Yolanda seemed more at ease, and the nurses said she was making progress. I handed her the bag, and she thanked me, her eyes filled with gratitude. As I left the hospital, I realized that the road ahead would be long and difficult. There were still many unanswered questions and unresolved feelings. But for now, I had to take it one day at a time, dealing with the reality of our new, complicated lives. Left to pick up the pieces of a shattered life, 
I found myself both relieved and haunted by the brutal end to her deceit. The reality of the situation sank in, leaving me to face an uncertain future, forever marked by the dark twists of fate that had unfolded. The first task was notifying Yolanda's family. Her parents lived out of state, and breaking the news over the phone was a challenge. They were shocked, their voices filled with a mixture of disbelief and sorrow. They promised to come as soon as they could, and I gave them the details of the hospital and the situation. With that done, I turned my attention to more practical matters. The house was in disarray, a stark reminder of the turmoil of the past few days. I began by cleaning the living room, picking up scattered items, and vacuuming the carpet. It was a small step, but it felt like progress. I decided to go grocery shopping. The pantry was nearly empty, and I needed to restock. The local grocery store was bustling with activity as people went about their routines. I wandered through the aisles, picking up essentials, milk, bread, vegetables, and some canned goods. At the checkout, the cashier gave me a polite smile, completely unaware of the storm raging in my life. Back home, I put away the groceries and made myself a simple lunch. As I ate, I went through the mail that had piled up. Bills, advertisements, and a few letters from friends and family. One letter caught my eye. It was from an old friend, Peter, whom I hadn't spoken to in years. I set it aside to read later, focusing on the immediate tasks at hand. Later that afternoon, I decided to take a walk around the neighborhood. The fresh air and familiar sights were comforting. I passed by Mrs. Henderson's house. She was out gardening as usual. She waved, and I waved back, appreciating the normalcy of the interaction. Continuing my walk, I saw kids playing in the park, their laughter echoing through the streets. It was a reminder that life went on, despite everything. Returning home, I found the letter from Peter. He had written to catch up, reminiscing about old times and suggesting we meet up. It was a welcome distraction, and I decided to call him later in the week. The following day, I visited Yolanda at the hospital again. Her condition was improving, and she was more alert. We talked about mundane things, the weather, her recovery, and what the doctors had said. I brought her some magazines and books to help pass the time. She thanked me, and we sat in comfortable silence for a while. After leaving the hospital, I stopped by a nearby coffee shop. The barista recognized me and made my usual order without asking. I took a seat by the window, sipping my coffee and watching people pass by. It was a small moment of peace in the midst of chaos. Back at home, I tackled more chores, laundry, dishes, and organizing the clutter that had accumulated. Each completed task gave me a small sense of accomplishment. I found an old box of photos and spent some time looking through them. There were pictures from our wedding, vacations, and everyday moments. They were bittersweet reminders of the life we once had. In the evening, I called Peter. We caught up on each other's lives, and I told him about Yolanda's situation in broad strokes. He offered his support and invited me to visit him in the city sometime. It was good to reconnect with an old friend, and I made plans to see him soon. Days turned into weeks, and slowly, a new routine emerged. I visited Yolanda regularly, helped her with her recovery, and continued to maintain the house. Her parents arrived and took over many of the caregiving duties, giving me some much-needed respite. One afternoon, while Yolanda's parents were at the hospital, I decided to take a drive to the countryside. It was a sunny day, and the open road was inviting. I drove without a specific destination in mind, enjoying the scenery and the sense of freedom. I stopped at a small diner for lunch, where the friendly waitress chatted with me about the local area. On the way back, I took a detour to a secluded park we used to visit. The place was quiet, with only the sounds of nature around. I sat on a bench, reflecting on the past and contemplating the future. The journey ahead was uncertain, but I felt a glimmer of hope. Returning home, I realized that while the road had been rough, there was still a path forward. Life had changed irrevocably, but there were still moments of beauty and connection to be found. With time, I hoped to rebuild and find a new sense of normalcy. For now, I took it one day at a time, facing each challenge as it came, and finding strength in the small victories.